Your Excellencies, distinguished guests of ladies and gentlemen, thank you for making the effort to come here to the Diwa Hall, to this session in particular, titled Towards the Debate of Gender Balance and Equal Treatment. نائبة رئيسة مجلس التوازن بين الجنسين في الإمارات تفضلي طابت أوقاتكم أنا أنه لمن دواعي فخري وسروري أن أرحب بكم وأن أرحب بضيفتنا المميزة الأستاذ لاغارد وأيضا الأستاذ أنخل الذي نأمل أن ينضم إلينا قريبا حضوركم يثبت أهمية الموضوع الذي نناقشه هنا من على هذه المنصة المرموقة التي يجتمع فيها قادة وزعماء من العالم على عد لعدة أيام ليتناقشوا وليطلقوا حوارا بناء نحن فعلا في مجلس التوازن بين الجنسين سعداء جدا ومتحمسون جدا للمشاركة في هذه topic. The Gender Balance Council mandated to develop and implement um, the UAE gender agenda and uh, promote uh, the uh, influence, the strong influence worldwide. And over the past uh, three years, the Gender Balance Council has created uh, a platform and implemented different initiatives uh, to reduce gender balance across all government uh, and private uh, sectors in the UAE. Hello, Mr. Angel. Welcome. <laughs> and we are actually uh, very excited also to have different initiatives across the uh, different agenda that we have in the Gender Balance Council. We, uh, although we live in a very challenging region, the Gender Balance Council has achieved important milestones in establishing the UAE as a benchmark and uh, actually rep uh, represent the UAE as a role model, a good role model in the region when it comes to gender balance uh, and uh, legislations. We are incredibly proud of the progress that we made over the past few years when it comes to gender uh, balance agenda in the UAE. We are also uh, have launched several initiatives. One of them is the gender index, the UAE gender index. Uh, that is uh, actually part of the UAE national um, uh, indicators that assesses the performance of uh, UAE government entities, organizations, and indiv individuals in enhancing and promoting gender balance. And another uh, initiative that the Council has actually worked on is the gender, uh, gender balance guide in collaboration with OECD. And this guide serves as a comprehensive resource to advance gender balance across private and government sector in the UAE. Uh, the, one of the great initiatives we're proud of, and that's why we're meeting here today to further discuss, is actually the gender, uh, the global gender count, uh, the global gender circle uh, that we believe added a lot of value for the UAE gender balance. Uh, internationally, it is for a uh, form to enhance uh, the women's uh, empowerment by providing a dynamic platform for ideas and for discussion uh, across different uh, platforms around the world in order to come up with outcomes that would support our agenda 
uh, gender agenda in the UAE and also at the same time uh, support our role in the SDGs uh, file, uh, uh, goal number five, uh, to achieve gender equality and uh, uh, women, all women, uh, empower all women and girls. And we are so proud that the first gender uh, circle was conducted in New York last March uh, during the UN Women meetings. And it was, uh, it was actually a great session where we had a lot of participants uh, from across uh, the world and had also experts in gender to discuss such important topic uh, the outcome of that session was a proposal or a concept on gender responsive budgeting, which we believe is something that we need to discuss further. And what we did is in November, last November 2017, we went to Washington and we've discussed this with the IMF, the World Bank, and also in New York with the UN Women. But we had another circle with IMF and it, uh, to discuss this further and find out the best practices and the standards that we can create a platform here in the UAE. And today, because we are in the UAE and we have such a great government with such uh, great uh, leaders and a great vision, this discussion we're bringing here to this prestigious event to further discuss and see and examine the best practices and uh, uh, standards that we can implement not only in the UAE, but also in the region. So thank you very much for your contribution and commitment also to be part of this. And I would like to thank the UAE Ministry of Finance for taking this seriously, because this is, uh, they'll play a very important role in this, hopefully. And I uh, would like to thank IMF, OECD, and uh, the, uh, the uh, UN Women and also the, the World Bank for their continuous support to the UAE Gender Balance Council initiatives. I would like now to call upon Madame Lagarde to uh, address her opening remarks. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Excellency, uh, for this introduction. And uh, I'll, I'll come back to your council because I think it's truly impressive what you've achieved in such a little uh, period of time. But I would first like to say how delighted I am to attend this session. And I think this is the first one that I attend here where there is a majority of women sitting in the first row. <laughs> so thank you very much, gentlemen, for sitting as well on the front row. And I would like to recognize a woman, all women in this room, all sisters, but one in particular who has been my friend for a long time and who was the first woman ever to be appointed as minister in this country, Sheikha Lubna, thank you for being with us. Now, I said I would come back to the Gender Balance Council, Mona, if I may call you that way, Your Excellency. I think it's truly impressive, impressive what you've done, because in a matter of a year and a half, correct me if I get that wrong, you've managed to establish yourself, you've managed to publish the Gender Balance Guide in 2017, and it's just barely a year and a half. Most institutions take time, organize their governance, and so on and so forth, before anything comes out of it. And you have a complete guide with benchmarks, steps to enhance gender balance in all aspects of daily life. Now, I know that you're full of energy and everybody has to be driven in the Emirates, but my goodness, you really achieved uh, something. And your engagement with international organizations such as ours and others to mainstream gender uh, budgeting in the UAE should really also be very productive. And I'm looking forward to the results of that effort. Now, I would like to dispel a misunderstanding about the IMF. Many people assume that the IMF talks about fiscal and talks about cutting here and raising there. We do lots of other things as well, and we are pretty concerned about social issues, social development, and the SDG number five is one of those that is particularly keen to my heart 
and one that I have uh, convinced the entire institution to work on and to focus on. Now, I'm doing that out of conviction, personally, and I think that my colleagues at the IMF, all staff included, are also doing it out of conviction, but particularly because making sure that women are empowered, can contribute to the economy, have access to finance, is actually a triple bonus. What do I mean by that? And I'm taking all conviction aside. From an economic point of view, it contributes to growth. And we've done analytical work, many institutions have done, the OECD under Angel's leadership has done it as well, the World Bank has done it. It is conducive to more growth. But not only that, it's also conducive to better growth. And it's conducive to better growth for two reasons. One, you reduce inequality by bringing in women into the workplace, by focusing on the gender gap that applies both to the participation into the labor market and to the wage gaps. So it's a growth that has less inequality about it, and it's also a growth that is more resilient because it's generally more diversified. We've done studies comparing countries where women are well included, participating actively, and those countries where it is not the case, and there is a clear difference in terms of less inequality, more diversification, more resilience, and certainly better growth. I'll give you just a few numbers that you see here and there in our literature and our publications. If you could eliminate gender employment gaps, you could boost GDP substantially. Now, I know it's a little bit um, artificial because it doesn't happen overnight, and it's going to take time in many countries. But assuming for a second that you could just like that, with a magic stick, eliminate this employment gap, you would increase growth by 5% in the United States, 9% in Japan, 27% in India, and over 30% in Egypt. Just think about it, where everybody wants more growth. Well, there is clearly a recipe there. Now, many people think that the IMF is really good at fiscal. Yes, we are. So what has fiscal got to do with this issue of women empowerment and women contributions? Because fiscal, and that's the point about the gender budgeting issues that we're discussing, it has an essential role to play. First of all, because macroeconomic policy and macroeconomic stability will help anyway. But second, because fiscal policies need to be actively shaped to achieve gender equality. And that's why gender budgeting is so important. Gender budgeting, some people think, oh, gender budgeting. Yes, I know, I do it. I have a ministry of women and girls. Uh-uh, that's not it. Gender budgeting is not about having a special, dedicated uh, group of terribly talented people focusing on that. It means, actually, transversally and across the board, focusing on what, in all budgets, is going to procure women's advancement, filling in the gaps, both in terms of labor participation and in terms of employment. And I'll give you a couple of examples of how it works. And this is not going to really apply to the Emirates. In a country where income tax is paid or with, withheld, you have the choice of either having taxpayers as individuals or taxpayers as a family. Which one do you think is more conducive to the participation of women from a fiscal point of view? Is it where it's the individual who is a taxpayer or when the family is a taxpayer? Okay. No, it's not where it's a, the family. And I'll tell you why. Because typically, particularly when you have an income tax that is progressive, typically the second earner is more taxed than the first earner. And guess who is the second earner in most cases? The woman. Yes. So moving from a family-based tax system to an individually-based tax system is far better in order to incentivize all to actually be taxed 
in an even way. Let me give you another example, and that will be a very simple one. When you spend some of your public finance into childcare centers, into specific benefits that are made available or that are guaranteeing the salary of a parent, I didn't say a mother, a parent, who is taking time off when a child is born, isn't that going to be supportive of women achieving what they can achieve in the workplace and contributing to the economy? Yes, it is. So, what we did, you know, aware of that, is that together with uh, the UK uh, DFID, the Department for International Development, we completed in 2016 the first ever global review of gender budgeting. Now, in addition, we did quite a few other things. We produced a policy paper on gender budgeting in the G7 countries, and we are currently doing that now for the G20 countries. And we will be releasing a book on fiscal policies and gender equality this spring. We have regional training centers that offer courses on gender budgeting, and we're also emphasizing the potential of gender, bu of gender budgeting to our member countries and offering technical assistance. Today, more than 80 countries in the world, out of the membership of 189 that we have, 80 countries are doing gender budgeting. And across the spectrum, from advanced economies to emerging market to low-income countries, more than 20 countries have legally mandated gender budgeting, and three countries, Austria, Bolivia, and Rwanda, have budgeting embedded in their constitution. Uganda has introduced a certificate on gender and equity compliance to ensure that women's needs are actually included in the budget process. And the UK Women's Budget Group started in, 19, in the 80s and conducts a thorough annual gender-sensitive analysis of the budget. The overall budget, not just one single budget, that would be dedicated to social affairs or education, the entire budget of the nation. Australia, Canada, Morocco, and Nepal have issued gender budget statements. So what have we seen in all those cases that we conducted in 2016? We have witnessed, let's say, four things. One is the best result is when the effort is led by the Ministry of Finance. Thank you for being present with us here in this room. Second, it's best when there is an established legal basis to justify gender budgeting. Uh, it's best when it included gender statements to improve reporting and transparency. And here we've also seen that whenever e-government is in place, it's easier and more accessible. And final uh, you know, findings is that it is much stronger if it has the support of parliament when there is a parliament and certainly non-governmental non organizations. So if you are present in this room, NGOs, thank you for actually holding everybody accountable on this matter of uh, NGOs. Uh, finally, two points. One is I'm delighted that we can all work with the UN in that respect and uh, UN Women, which is actively led uh, for over two decades, has been working with ministries, with parliamentarians, CSOs, to implement gender budgeting by providing training and capacity development. We cooperate very much together and try to work uh, around that particular topic. Just to give you an example of what we do also, um, quickly. Uh, about th two months ago in Rwanda, which is a country where clearly women have their space, more than 50% of members of parliament are women, half the government is women, and for historical and, and very sad reasons, women have a lot of space in that economy. But we conducted a particular two days conference with many policymakers attending to actually identify how you can reach a better equality and how you can improve the economy by, ha by having the women contribute. Gender budgeting was one item. In Mauritius, in a few weeks, we will also be organizing a pre peer learning workshop. So it's not the IMF going and doing this, 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 we know it all better, no. We have the countries that are doing it come and explain to others how difficult it has been, what results it has provided, and how helpful it is. So I would like, by way of closing, I would like to pay tribute to the, um, to the UAE. 
the progress of women in terms of literacy, primary, secondary, and higher education has been nothing less than staggering in the last 10 years. Very impressive and amazing. According to the Global Gender Gap Report, UAE has moved up the world ranking from 112 in 2006 to 67 in 2017. And there is more to come, I'm sure. But it's not 100% perfect, as I said in the previous session, because there are clearly significant gaps. The female labor force participation is still 50% lower than that of men. By choice, by necessity, by cultural background, to be determined, but although compared with other countries, it is significantly good, there is still a way to go. And in terms of um, difference of compensation for the same job, there is still a long way to go as well. So in those two directions, Mona, there is clearly more for you to do, and I have no doubt that uh, under your leadership, things will move, and I have full trust that uh, UAE men and women will take that task uh, seriously, and that next year we'll be able to report even more progress than we are. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Madam Lagarde. I'd like to introduce the Secretary General of the OECD, Angel Goria. Well, I'd like to join Christine in congratulating the UAE Gender Balance Council uh, Minister and Ministers uh, for highlighting the topic of gender budgeting. Uh, this is an essential tool in the fight for gender equality. The partnership of the OECD with the UAE in advancing good governance for gender equality dates back to 2010. Last year, we actually released a gender balance guide under the leadership of uh, the Gender Balance Council. And we, championed, uh, we were championed by His Highness uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. Our discussion today builds on the enduring dialogue with the United Arab Emirates and your commitment, all of your commitment to gender equality. Now, within the OECD, our own commitment to gender equality is framed by the landmark 2015 recommendation. It's called Gender Equality on Public Life. It's not just about economics uh, and every day and or in the board. Uh, Christine was mentioning some uh, pretty impressive numbers. I like to say, you know, I'm, I'm a Mexican, and uh, I like to say in Mexico, we're already at about 50-50, but it needed a legislation. It didn't happen spontaneously. It needed a legislation that made it mandatory that the parties would present 50% candidates. So eventually, we got 50% participation or over time, it didn't happen. It didn't happen spontaneously. We'll also soon be launching the gender in governance toolkit in order to be able to say, okay, you know, you kind of check the boxes a little bit and say where you are. Uh, and then, of course, it's about policy. It's about policy. It's about policy. Again, it doesn't happen spontaneously. Uh, the 40 percent participation in boards, for example, from uh, Norway. This happened about 10 or 12 years ago, but it was legislated. The 30% participation in Germany, it was legislated. And as I said, the 50% participation of women in Mexican uh, um, uh, legislature was legislated. It didn't happen uh, spontaneously. Um, we don't like quotas, but sometimes you just need to act uh, very decisively in order to force things to happen. And then it becomes kind of a the status quo. Christine said growth, better growth. I would also add, you know, more lasting growth because only if you actually add uh, the uh, female participation into the workforce will this uh, go through over time. Now, last year we published a, a major report to taking stock in the progress 
that's been made around the world in tackling gender inequalities. The report shows that in education, young women are far less likely than men to enroll in STEM subjects. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics much less likely. In the labor market, mothers are 23% less likely than fathers to have paid employment. We estimate that on average across the OECD, if we halved, just half, you know, Christine mentioned about how do we take it to the, to the you know, equality, just half those differences, uh, the gender gap in labor force, we could achieve as much as 6% growth. So, you know, the, the numbers vary, but the potential is clearly there. It's almost explosive in nature. So, apart from the moral imperative, the ethical imperative, even the political imperative, I'd say there is an economic imperative that we cannot afford to ignore. In order to make progress, gender equality needs to be fully mainstreamed in policy. And tools such as gender budgeting offer tangible opportunities for assessing policies' impact on gender equality. When we analyze policies closely, we learn that the way we raise taxes, the way we spend money, is often, in, the case, in most cases, gender neutral. It doesn't help us to change the status quo. Christine mentioned Austria, the case of Austria in particular. Uh, it revised the tax code so that second earners uh, you know, he, she was putting a theoretical question to us, you know, what do you, who do you think suffers most? Clearly the women, it's a disincentive when you add the two wages and then you increase the average tax for the couple. It's a, clearly a disincentive. So mostly women, they are no longer going to be penalized for entering the workforce. And it's catching. In the Netherlands, state subsidies for universities are now linked to gender balance in professorships and governing boards. You want the money? Well, you know, show me that you're working on gender balance. So again, it's catching on other areas. Sometimes we have to take a little, look a little harder to find the links between policies and gender in places that go beyond the obvious. Iceland, for example, now looks at the multiple gender-specific impacts of huge infrastructure projects. An inspiring example also comes from Sweden, which conducted the gender analysis of its snow clearing policies. Now you say, what does snow clearing have anything to do with gender? Well, the city of Stockholm found that because they cleared main roads first and local roads and footpaths last, Maine were gaining most of the benefits in commuting time and so on. But you know, clearing snow is not a problem that you have here too often, okay? Uh, we in Paris never had it and we just had this big snowstorm uh, ever in 10 years. So while women working in the locality, traveling to schools and childcare facilities suffered more. So the city, reordered the snow clearing priorities to spread the benefits more equally. I don't know what the people who were driving the buses and the cars and everything on the main streets thought about this, but anyway, they got the gender balance right. The OECD framework for gender budgeting is being developed to help countries unlock and discover these hidden insights from within public policies. Because, you know, you're talking about diving into the problem. You said, why does a problem like, uh, you know, snow clearing or why does a problem like big infrastructure projects have anything to do with gender? And then you take a look at the second derivative, you take a look at the third derivative, and you find that actually there is a problem. There is a problem with professorships. There is a problem with expectations. And as I mentioned before, there is a big problem with STEM. 
You know, in Mexico, we found out that the problem did not start at the workplace. It did not even start at the school. The problem with STEM started in the families because already the mothers and even the fathers were telling their girls what they expected them to be and telling their boys what they expected them to be. So already they determined the vocation even before the children were going to the school where the teachers continued to, you know, confirm the stereotype. And then, of course, you ended up with a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know? If everybody was telling the girl what she was going to be, then she ended up being that. Huh? But she did not know what the alternatives were. In Mexico, we did something pretty simple. We got the 100 most successful uh, women in STEM just to go to this to the schools and tell them what it was about to be an astronaut or to be the head of the Meteorological Institute or to be the head of the observatory to look at the, uh, the, the, the planets or whatever, just, just the scientist, the business person, just to let them know what it was possible and not in universities, but in primary school, in high school when they're still not making their decisions of what they want to be, but rather to open their eyes to see what they could be, you know? So let me um, just mention about this green budgeting implication now. It's being developed to help countries unlock and discover these hidden insights, as I said. And let me look at some insights. First, it is not an easy matter to do gender budgeting it is important to apply a systematic and coherent approach across the full budget cycle and the budget processes. Second, full institutional engagement with gender budgeting is necessary. And here it means it's not one ministry, but the broad spectrum of the government. This includes the parliament at the center of government, auditors, civil society, to ensure a link to independent challenge perspectives. National gender equality institutions, like the Gender Balance Council, therefore have a central role to play in leading, supporting, and coordinating key cross-government engagement for gender equality. And third, gender budgeting cannot work as a standalone tool. It needs to be organically linked with a country's gender equality strategy and with national development strategies. Performance-based budgeting systems, such as the system in place within the United Arab Emirates, can serve as a valuable bridge between budgeting targets and strategic goals. And of course, gender balance guide actions for United Arab Emirates organizations. You know, we are working uh, by, you know, this, thank you very much, Minister, for your support and for, you know, this is. In conclusion, dear friends, ministers, to get gender equality policies right, we need a vision, we need an ambition, we need a sense of mission, but we also need coordination. We need leadership, and we need to resource the right policies. So we look forward to maintaining the OECD's strong partnership with the UAE in leading the way for gender equality in the region and elsewhere. Thank you very much. I just want to say on the part of CNBC News, thank you so much for having us, uh, hosting this as a, a, a gender budgeting, and certainly at the World Government Summit, it means that everyone seems to be taking this topic extremely seriously. Um, I might need to boost my audio a little bit. Um, I woke up with a cold. Who would believe it here in the UAE? 
So I just want to introduce our panelists very quickly. Um, Dr. Lisa Kolovich, you're an economist with the IMF. His Excellency, Yunus El Khoury, the Undersecretary of the UAE's Ministry of Finance. Sora Khan, who is a policy advisor for UN Women. And Marcus Bonturi, Director for Public Governments at the OECD. So we heard from their excellencies, Madame Lagarde and Mr. Guria, about a lot of the challenges when it comes to increasing women in the workforce, in terms of taxation policies. I want to kick off by asking you, Zora, with your 20 years of experience in terms of what these governments are telling you, where do you see gender budgeting uh, really going? I mean, where's the next step? Because you have to convince these governments, do you not, that this is, as Mr. Guria said, a moral, ethical, and economic imperative. Thank you for that. Uh, I guess in the UAE, we have been following a set of standards in the UAE, and we have been taking the challenge w whenever it's possible. And a key issue always comes the society itself, the citizen themselves. As long as we can understand and we can determine the needs for the uh, gender budgeting and the impact of the gender budgeting on the society and on the UAE nationals, because the government will, is willing to take that challenge forward once they will understand the basis. And also in the UAE, we have set up an excellent platform whereby we exchange the requirements, the recommendations from other outsiders uh, uh, between the federal government and the local governments. We can take that analysis and look forward how we can benefit. We want to follow on to that, Zora, because we're talking about not just governments who have to be involved in this, but you also are talking about the potential for corporate as well and financials, because it really, if this is about an economic imperative, there are real opportunities there for the private sector to really push the government along. It's always uh, important in the UAE that we set up the example first. So we have to adopt internally, and then we can sell it to the private sector. Uh, as long as the government take, is taking the lead, as long as the government has implemented, and then we can take it forward and we can discuss it with the private sector. And, and again, in the UAE, we have set up an excellent platform, and the platform through the media, through the, uh, the corporate communications, through multiple channels, we can always sell the concept and start adopting. And, 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 and for, for a person working for a Ministry of Finance, uh, introducing new resources in the market itself. As long as we have the women participation, then we add to their purchasing power. If they are richer and if, if we create that wealth, definitely their expenditure will add. And once their expenditure will add, the impact of it will be on the government revenue. So the participation of the women is a key to us. The participation of the gender itself, it's very important. Let's look at it more from a global perspective in terms of you and women. Zora, if you want to take it on from there. I think both um, our opening speakers really set out some of the challenges really well. Um, and I think for us as UN Women, having done this for 20 years now, we see challenges for gender budgeting on two levels. One pertains to the institutional and political, and the other pertains to the actual technical challenges linked with uh, data. So I'll start quickly with the uh, political or institutional. I think Madame Lagarde quite rightly in, um, in her opening remarks talked about um, the institutional culture of ministries of finance and I think sometimes it's very very difficult when working with ministries of finance to actually get across the importance of gender equality and the importance of ministries of finance using their mandate on fiscal policy to advance gender equality outcomes at UN Women we often talk about breaking the glass ceiling. Um, our work in ministries of finance has also shown us that there are sticky floors um, where women within ministries of finance are often in, in quite low, uh, low paid jobs. And they're also the concept of broken ladders. So women advancing within ministries of finance to make it to the top um, echelon sometimes becomes quite elusive. And if you don't have the voices of women within the ministries of finance, it's very, very hard to identify what the main gender gaps in societies are. And the work with civil society, the work with parliamentarians is absolutely vital, of course, but it is the mandate of finance ministries to do this work. The other challenge I see is a technical one, and it links a lot to the lack of data on what gender gaps are, and we see this across, across the world, in developing countries, uh, in middle-income countries, in developed countries, and so on. 
And UN Women uh, now within the framework of the Sustainable Development Goal 5 has actually developed an international standard on gender budgeting that looks at some of the best practices in the world and tries to uh, harmonize that into a methodology that can be applied to all countries. So I think those are the two main challenges I see. And you work with Lisa as well quite often on this in terms of the IMF, in terms of that implementation as well. What are the challenges there? Because as we were saying, you do often have to really push governments to see perhaps what's best for them. Sure. I, I think one thing that we find when we talk about gender budgeting, whether I'm talking with economists, policymakers, ministries of finance, is that when I say gender budgeting, people often think it's just a separate budget for women. And that's not what we're looking at at all. When we talk about gender budgeting, what we're thinking of is identifying gender gaps. And in many cases, those gender gaps are, of course, affecting women disproportionately compared to men. But there are gender gaps, too, that affect men disproportionately. And so gender budgeting then allows ministries of finance, the sectoral ministries, to look at those gaps and figure out how best to attack them, how best to, to remedy them. Um, so I'll give an example of, of men um, and their, um, uh, their lower life expectancy. So in advanced markets, we found that um, men with tertiary education live on average four to 14 years longer than men with only secondary or primary education. And gender budgeting can be used to address something like that. Um, in, in Ukraine, for example, we found that um, men are disproportionately affected by tuberculosis. And so gender budgeting has been used to address that kind of gender gap too. Now it often, of course, affects gender gaps in education for women, addressing female labor force participation, um, female health concerns. So gender budgeting is, of course, very important for there. But I want to emphasize that it's not just extra spending for women. It's looking at identifying these gaps, these critical gaps, these macro critical gaps, and figuring out how best to use the budget to remedy and, and rectify those gaps. Marcus, when you look at this from an OECD perspective, we heard from Mr. Gurria, and he was essentially saying that while nobody wants to set quotas, sometimes quotas have to be the first step. Yeah, very often in this case, uh, we have seen the clear benefits uh, of, of, of quotas. And, and uh, um, I mean, but, but let, me, let me go back to the issue of the challenges. Uh, um, gender budgeting is not a silver bullet. And I think we have to realize that, that gender budgeting, there are lots of things perhaps, perhaps we need to do before uh, uh, going to gender, gender budgeting. And in, in some countries across the world, there are some uh, uh, discrimination that is actually enshrined in the legal system or there are cultural issues that, that also serve as a main impediment to gender equality. So again, it's not, it's not a silver bullet. It helps a lot. And I, I, I will uh, uh, corroborate what uh, my colleague from UN Women has said. The, the, the data gap is huge. Uh, we have been investing a lot at the OECD in, in uh, having a gender lens in our data collection, be it on education or the PISA program, on health outcomes, you name it. And that helps a lot. Uh, when you do the gender budgeting, and that's really the key and the main challenge is not just having a checklist, but then what is the impact on policy? And for that, you do need the gender sensitive data that we are producing more and more in cooperation with, with, with other organizations, including UN Women, with whom we just signed an MOU. So that, that link, what does it mean for policy? And, and Secretary General Gurria was mentioning some interesting examples from Austria on tax policy to Sweden and in snow cleaning, but, but there are many, many examples at different levels of government. And once you have the data sensitive, da uh, the gender sensitive data, how does that actually impact? And then the link between what the Minister of Finance is determining at a broad sense and, and the line ministries that are actually spending the money is essential. So the coordination mechanisms also have to be in place. Talk to me a little bit about the implementation, though, in the sense that when we look at it from an IMF perspective in particular, there are opportunities, and I mentioned this in the beginning, for the private sector to really um, help governments to see what could potentially be uh, areas in which gender budgeting could really change the game when it comes to employment, and obviously that means broader productivity. Sure. Sure. So let, let me give you the example of Morocco. So we, we looked at Morocco and we saw that, and Morocco has done quite a bit of work on gender budgeting, um, but we looked at the, uh, the losses from gaps in female labor force participation on per capita income. And we found that if we were to close that gap, that gender gap in, in labor force participation, per capita income in Morocco would be 50% higher. Now that's substantial. 
Um, and so what gender budgeting can do then, if the private sector, the public sector, CSOs, NGOs, different organizations want to work to address that gap there, um, one thing they can do is try to implement better childcare, um, improve females' access to education, um, so allow them to have the skills necessary to go into um, new types of jobs and, and advance their careers. Uh, so provide providing for childcare, reducing uh, tax policies that might have discriminatory um, angles to them, and then also um, making sure that women have of uh, the ability and uh, the like, safe public transportation to get to work if they need to. So, so we talked about the, the numbers, really, in terms of the implementation, and you have to be able to show these governments by the numbers how much uh, of an improvement this could be to their overall productivity as countries. But in terms of private sector versus public sector, or, or even really just working together, what's the narrative got to be? Because oftentimes you have all of this information, you have all of this data, but somehow you're just not making things move forward. Okay, so let me give you another example, too, from, from Europe. So we did a study at the IMF. We looked at the impact of quotas um, on women and participation in um, corporate boards and in senior management positions. And if you were to substitute one woman for one man on a corporate board, we saw that there is an increase in return on assets of about 8 to 13 basis points. So right there, for the private sector, they have an incentive to encourage women to join the corporate boards, to join senior management, because it's a matter of higher profitability, higher productivity. That, of course, translates into higher growth, more stable growth, you have a more diverse workforce. Um, and so that kind of information there, when, when the private sector realizes that greater diversity, um, greater female involvement in the workforce has a return on their profitability, that can then um, start, to start the conversation with the private sector getting involved with the public sector. And encouraging the public sector, either through gender budgeting or through other policies, to implement the kinds of reforms that are needed. Again, childcare, tax reform, um, those kinds of things that might help. The UAE so far has been a really shining example here of, of the ability for the government, the public sector, the private sector to really work together. Um, going forward, what are some of the things that you see as possible? You've put out this new gender balance guide, you're talking about gender budgeting, what's next? From the discussion I hear, I think uh, the key area would be is uh, more of uh, involving women into the private sector itself. Uh, the private sector being very dynamic, uh, being in multiple sectors, and, and one of the key challenges will be how to enroll uh, the, the new graduates into different sectors, uh, other than the norm sectors that we see the women enrolling more. Uh, I think this is one of the key challenges uh, we will see. Uh, going back to, to Han's uh, comment whether uh, we have women in uh, the ministry itself, I think today uh, uh, the women being responsible for uh, the government financial and uh, them being more than 50% of the workforce, uh, we already have a big uh, basis on that level and also on the quality of the data um, uh, since the Ministry of Finance had decided to join IMF, uh, GDS, and GFS uh, statistics, I think the basis of the data itself being available, uh, how much of the analysis, and how we can get into the details of the analysis, and looking forward to what we need to change and what to adopt, I think that will be the next step. Marcus, do you want to weigh in there in terms of, at the end of the day, for most countries, this is about um, overcoming the politics, you know, hot button words like quotas. Certainly, when you're talking about that in the political context, you can also get a lot of pushback. How do you go beyond that? I mean, I think I think we have to make the economic case very, very clearly. Uh, it is an ethnical issue, it's a moral issue, but it's first and foremost an economic issue. And, and I think we're just scratching the surface. Uh, uh, Secretary General Gurria mentioned the the work we have done to estimate. Uh, what would be the impact of halving, just make, turn, cutting by half the participation gap, the labor market participation gap? Women in typically participate less in, 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 uh, in the labor force. And that's uh, over, uh, between now and 2030, 6% of GDP across OECD countries. But that's not taking into account the, the underutilization of women's skills, which is a major issue in some countries. So you, ha you, you, you have to continue to make the case uh, that if a society is to uh, prosper, it needs to use the fullest, uh, the skills set of its population. And of course, without talking dynamics of investing in skills and giving access to, to uh, 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 women, to education opportunities, to employment opportunities. Uh, so, so all that needs to be brought into account. And we're just, we cannot totally estimate that 
But even for the simple things we can estimate, the business case is obvious. When you look at it from a UN perspective as well, it, it seems to be there's, there's a difficulty in messaging here. It seems obvious when you look at the numbers, but at the same time, it's communicating with governments in the private sector. Where are you at the UN in terms of really working with each individual country? Because an emerging market, a developing country, is a very different scenario than certainly the United States or Western Europe. I just it, want to pick up on, on the point that uh, my OECD colleague has raised because I think you know, it's, it's absolutely right to make the ec economic case, but it's also very important to make the human rights case. And I think where gender responsive budgeting is really important is that it focuses on women's needs in its entirety. So it looks not just at resources or investment for women to enter the labor market, but it looks at resources and investment for all of women's needs throughout their life cycles. And I think that's a really important value added of gender responsive budgeting. Um, and especially, as you, as you correctly say, the importance of finance ministries working with sector ministries. I mean, that's absolutely vital. If finance ministries set out a directive for gender budgeting and say, look, we have a legal framework, we have a policy framework, but it's really the sector ministries that have to come in and say, well, for the health sector, for education, you know, if we want to increase women in STEM and so on, this is what we need allocated to programs that will drive that progress forward. So I think this coordination um, and working together is extremely important. I mean, our position at UN Women is very clear. Uh, we work with everyone. So we have to, in order to have successful gender budgeting, we have to have a multi-stakeholder approach. So working with women's organizations, working with parliamentarians and so on. And you know, just a key role that the private sector can play is in terms of women's financial inclusion. Um, you know, across the world, numbers um, are staggeringly low, uh, and this could be some something you know very positive, uh, especially when we look at what technological developments are out there in the world. It's getting easier and easier, but yet more uh, more women don't have access to financial inclusion. So what are we not doing there? How do you harness the momentum that we've seen over the last year or so? Because there's been the Me Too movement, then you've also seen it certainly at the World Economic Forum for women leading the forum for the very first time. How do you harness the momentum that we're seeing behind getting women into the workforce and actually making something uh, in terms of legislation and policy and implementation that keeps them there and really goes beyond the numbers? So, so I'll start. I, th I think for us, of course, our challenge is that we always want to make the economic case, right? And I think, again, the evidence is clear. I mean, we've shown it in many different ways, but that's something that we are continually working on, too, is coming up with um, more quantitative analysis, empirical analysis, to show that gender budgeting impacts lives, it has an impact on your economy, and this is just an overall effective and efficient way to use your limited resources I mean, to allocate things efficiently. Because certainly the, what, one of the themes, obviously, at the World Government Summit is the happiness agenda, the happiness report. And of course, if you're going to be a, a better individual and a more productive member of society, then obviously you want to feel involved in, in this inclusive growth, with these opportunities. Um, panelists, we're going to have to leave it there. I want to thank you all so much for joining us. And hopefully, um, we'll be able to hear each other a little bit better the next time around. <laughs> thank you.